So you're standing on a diving board in the middle of an open space. You look down, but that's not a pool. It's a giant black hole. Well, what the heck. You start swinging and then you jump. The gravity of the black hole grabs you and you pick up speed. Just a little more and you'll enter the dark abyss. But you're not afraid. You're sure you can survive the fall into the black hole. Besides, you have a clear goal to travel through time. But first, let's figure out how it works and why time stops near a black Hmm. hole. This is the space-time grid. It's what our entire universe is made of. And just like a regular grid, it sags if you put something heavy on it, (laughs) like me. For example, let's put the planet Earth here. You see a little funnel that is formed around the Earth. And if you put a small ball next to the planet, it'll roll into the funnel. That's how gravity works. The heavier the object, the more it bends space-time. By comparison, here's the Sun. It's almost 333,000 times heavier than the Earth. So it makes a really big funnel. So big that all the planets in our solar system move around that star inside that funnel. So now, let's put a black hole on a space-time grid. Its centers are infinitely heavy, so they create a limitless deep well. And anything caught in the black hole's gravitational field can never leave it, not even moving at the speed of light. Okay, their gravity is infinitely strong, but why do they slow down time? It's all about the speed of light. According to physics law, the speed of light must be the same at every point in our universe, even in a black hole. So, for our experiment, we take this ball, a photon of light that can travel 671 million miles per hour. You could get from Earth to the Sun at that speed in 8 minutes. That's how long it takes light to travel from our star to our eyes. So, when you're looking at the sun, you're looking back in time 8 minutes ago. By the way, don't look at it directly. Now, the critical thing to remember here is that velocity consists of two physical quantities. Space, miles, and time, hours. We'll use that later. Now, let's look at the black hole in our space-time grid. In three-dimensional space, it appears like this. But if we assume that space is two-dimensional, our grid looks like this when viewed from above just a lot of squares. And this is the black hole right in the middle. If you look at the grid from the side, you'll see a straight line. And the black hole here looks like a pit, or like an endless well. Now, let's follow our photon of light in three-dimensional space. Here, it's moving toward the black hole, and then it falls into the well of the black hole. And it continues its motion at a constant speed. Now, the side view. Again, the photon moves from left to right, and then falls its velocity doesn't change. The problems begin if you look at the experiment from above. When the photon of light moves in the distance of the black hole, its speed is stable. But then it goes down into the well. First, it slows down, and then it just stands still. But it's moving downwards. The photon moves in an arc down the well in the lower dimension without changing its speed. But in the higher dimension, it traveled a minimal distance at the same speed. Usually, this would mean that the photon was moving at a low speed in the second case, but not in the case of the speed of light. Remember, it must be the same at every point in the universe. The number 671 million miles per hour shouldn't change. So, we change the very parameters of that number, time. Time itself must slow down so much that this slight movement of the photon when you look at it from above was at the same speed. 671 million miles per hour. But if you go down and look at this well much lower, you see that its walls are almost vertical. So a photon of light would be moving in a vertical trajectory. That means that if you look at it from above, the photon will just be standing still. Again, its velocity can't change, so time will vary. At that point, it should just stop. This is what happens near a black hole. Now, if you look at a black hole, you can see this effect in action. It swallows up the light around it. But as for an observer, it seems to you that the light stays in orbit around the black disk. In fact, at that moment, the photons are still moving at the speed of light inside the black hole. It's because time has slowed down there so much that you feel like the light has stopped there. This disk is called the event horizon, the point of no return, the last stop before you go into the black abyss. And at the very center of the black hole is the singularity. This point of space is so dense that if you try to describe it with any numbers or physical quantities, 
they would all tend toward infinity. Simply put, all the laws of physics we know just stop working here. So scientists can't say exactly what awaits you in the singularity. Before you make that jump into the black hole, let's drop a space probe there with a blue light that flashes once per second. And let's attach giant clocks to it. You see the probe falling into the black hole, gaining speed. But then it starts to slow down. Moreover, the probe flattens out and seems to spread out around the black hole. And then you notice that the blue beacon on the probe has changed its light. It now flashes as red. It's because the light is a wave. Blue is a truly short wave with a high frequency. But the black hole's gravity acts on this wave, stretching it out. The light waves get lengthened and become broader and less frequent. The new wavelength and frequency match with the red color. It's called redshift. Also, the probe blinks now not once a second in short beeps, but lights up and goes out for a long time. It's because of the time warp. If you, as an observer, look at the clock on the probe, the second hand there barely moves. However, the clock on your hand works as usual. But if you could be in a black hole, time would seem normal to you. And the arrow on the clock would move as it did before. But the hands on the clock outside the black hole would move like crazy to you. That's because time goes much faster outside the black hole. Oops, your probe just got ripped apart. That's because of the substantial difference in gravity that acts on the probe. The black hole's gravitational force increases with every foot of approach. That is, if you were to extend your hand toward the black hole hard, the gravity on your fingers would be much stronger than on your shoulder. This force would cause your fingers to lengthen, simply like spaghetti. That's why many people think it's impossible to survive falling into a black hole. But scientists think you could survive without a problem. Hey, maybe they should jump first just to make sure. <laughs> The thing is, you have to pick a black hole as big as possible, like the ones at the centers of galaxies, for example. That bright spot at the center of the Milky Way also has a black hole. It's about 1 million times heavier than the Sun. And this is the Messier 87 galaxy, one of the most massive galaxies among our neighbors. In 2019, humanity got its first ever photo of the black hole at the center of this galaxy. It's about 6.5 billion times heavier than our sun. So it's the perfect place to make your jump into a black hole finally. Let's go! At first, you feel a strong acceleration as the incredible force of gravity grabs you. But in the case of a supermassive black hole like this, the gravity doesn't change as dramatically. That's because of its size. Right now, the gravitational force on your legs is about equal to the gravitational force on your head. So you don't turn into spaghetti, and you feel comfortable. You see that the light from the stars and all the space around you has begun to shrink at a certain point. It means that you have already passed the event horizon and are now moving toward the black hole's heart. As a result, the light of the universe becomes a small dot for you and then disappears altogether. If we look at our space-time grid, you're already falling into a well. Time is completely stopped for you. However, the rest of the world continues to move steadily through time. If you could now look at the Earth from a black hole, you would see a time-lapse, an accelerated video of how the months and years go by on our planet. If you had a jetpack that had an incredible engine to pull you out of the black hole, then you can make a jump forward in time. In one second, centuries on Earth could pass in the heart of a supermassive black hole. But this only works one way. You can't go back in time. But for now, you keep falling into the black hole. Beyond that, no one knows what'll happen to you. We only have theories about wormholes and white holes that might transfer you somewhere else in the universe. So enjoy your trip and just think about all the frequent flyer miles you're racking up. <laughs> We're traveling a thousand light years from our planet to an unfamiliar system. Here, there are two bright stars orbiting close to each other. But there is one small but very massive thing here as well a black hole. These objects are mysterious and dangerous. They're capable of swallowing our entire world in one second without even noticing it. Even more, they can tear apart a huge star like our Sun. And it's these giants that usually lie at the centers of galaxies. 
They're so heavy that their gravity holds countless stars, planets, and stardust around them. They can weigh millions or even billions of times more than the Sun. And now, you're back on the ground at a rocket launch pad on Earth. All you can think about is holding your breath and jumping into the heart of that black pearl. But you don't have to hold your breath because you'll be in a spacesuit, and the oxygen is included free of charge. Besides, you're not likely to ever make it to the black hole. A trip that far with the technology we have now would take tens of thousands of years. Back to your garage where you stashed your hyper-rocket, which will take you to the black hole in seconds. And you're next to two stars in a black hole. First thing you notice is that the black holes aren't black. Its gravitational force pulls in not only objects, but even light itself. This makes the hole invisible. You can only see a bright ring around it. That's called the event horizon. It consists of twisted light, hot dust, plasma, and pieces of asteroids that are also trapped there. So the event horizon is the first obstacle to overcome. Okay, you put on your jetpack, open your rocket's door, and jump towards the black hole. The force of gravity begins to pull you quickly toward it. The spacesuit protects you from the enormous temperatures and levels of radiation on the event horizon. Conventional protective gear would hardly help you. So you thank your dad for stashing this super-powerful protective suit in your garage as well. You begin to feel like your body's stretching unpleasantly. The problem is that gravity increases with every inch closer to the center of the black hole. And it's much stronger at your head than at your feet. Your body starts to stretch like spaghetti. That's why it's called spaghettification. No suit can protect you from that. And there isn't a single spaceship that can withstand that kind of strain. Well, this was a short video. Okay, let's rewind to the moment before the jump. You realize that to get to the heart of the black hole and survive, you don't need improved equipment, but another black hole. And it's the size and weight of it that matters here. Theoretically, you can survive falling into a supermassive black hole. It's all about the width of the black hole's event horizon. When a hole is small, about the weight of our sun, the event horizon is small too. And then its edge is remarkably close to the center of the abnormal gravitational force, which would make you spaghettified quickly and uh, brutally. But if the event horizon is wide, it's farther from the center of the gravitational force. Then the difference of gravity pressing on your head and feet will be non-existent. So if you have enough air in your spacesuit, you can survive such a journey. So you must pick a supermassive black hole. Hmm, let's see. One at the center of the Milky Way? No, there's too much hot plasma and debris around it. You need a completely isolated black hole for a jump like this. Somewhere in dark space where it hasn't had time to gather the debris of neighboring worlds around it. You quickly open your space map and find such a black hole. One faster than light trip and you've arrived. There it is! A huge dark nothing. There's only distorted light from distant stars and galaxies on its event horizon. To test your theory, you throw a mannequin into it. It approaches the black hole and then slows to a standstill. But it's just an illusion. The black hole is so heavy, it can warp both space and time. So to the observer, the dummy is frozen in the event horizon. But it has long since entered its heart. The dummy didn't get spaghettified like you did when you fell into a small black hole. So now you're confidently jumping after it. Remember that even if you feel fine, it's still a one-way trip. Once in the black hole's field of attraction, nothing can escape its embrace. No matter how powerful a rocket you have or how hard you flap your arm, you're now at the edge of the accretion disk. Every second here equals weeks or months on Earth. You're traveling through time. Our home planet may already have flying cars and skyscrapers several miles tall all over the place. But for you, it's only a couple of minutes. Whoa! All the light you see from the stars has turned red. That too is because of gravity. The light we see is waves, but the black hole stretches them out. The short wavelengths of blue become long and red. 
Great! You've passed the event horizon and are now heading into black nothingness. You look up and see a thin ray of light. The last thing you see, in fact. After that, there's just black void. No one knows what happens next. Some theories say black holes can be portals to another dimension, or to another place in the universe. By jumping into a black hole in our galaxy, you can jump hundreds of thousands of light years away from our home. In that case, you will experience your fall in reverse. First, you see a small but expanding beam of light. Then, red starlight returns to blue. And before you know it, you're back on the event horizon. And soon after, you're free of the black hole's pool. But scientists still can't confirm this theory. Okay, that's too grim. So just this time, we'll bring you back to Earth in the company of your friends. They praise you for your accomplishment of surviving the center of a black hole. Now you're the heart of the company, and no black hole can scare you. But even the biggest black hole in space isn't as scary as you might think. They have a lifespan. That radiation I mentioned takes energy from the black hole. If it doesn't have food around it, the hole starts to deflate like a balloon. And eventually, there's nothing left. Another fear around black holes is that we can create one at home. Indeed, inside the Large Hadron Collider, scientists conduct experiments with small particles colliding at high speed. There are huge bursts of energy. And some scientists believe this energy is enough to create a microscopic black hole. It will begin to absorb its surroundings and grow. First, some small objects in the room where it was created. Then, the entire lab. The hole continues to grow and is already consuming our whole planet. It changes the balance of power in our solar system and absorbs the planets one by one. When those are finished, it's time for dessert, the sun. The light upper layers of plasma are stretched into long spaghetti and pulled toward the black hole. Then, layer by layer, our star collapses into the dark abyss. When the sun is half absorbed, the black hole shoots a beam of energy and light outwards and continues to consume the sun. In mere moments, there's nothing left of our solar system. That's how some people describe the end of the world. But even if we do manage to create a microscopic black hole, we'll be safe. It'll be too small to absorb big objects, and it will only feed on small atomic particles. Black holes emit energy as well as consume it, so our little one won't have time to grow. It'll lose more than it finds in a fraction of a second. So what you'll see is a momentary flash and then nothing. Although creating a stable and controlled black hole may even be useful, they emit enormous amounts of energy that we can use. A black hole the mass of Mount Everest could power all of humanity. Of course, black holes are still dangerous. But we can watch them and study our universe. If we stay far enough away, of course. So, you decide to put a padlock on that garage door. For now. So, do you know why the ocean is salty? We didn't know the reason until 1979. The whole planet is covered with ocean, and we had no idea where all that salt comes from. We initially thought rivers were to blame because they can carry deposits and chemicals to the still waters. It wasn't until the late 1970s when scientists stumbled upon so-called black smokers that we realized they were the cause of the salty waters. They are, in fact, geothermal vents located along the mid-ocean ridge. They were generated from sediments of iron sulfide from deep within the Earth's core. Okay, remember dinosaurs? I don't. I wasn't around then. But they disappeared a long time ago. Yet how that happened was still up for debate within the scientific community for a very long time. Up until 1991, no less, the year the Chicxulub Crater was discovered. That's a big hole located underneath the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Many claim it was formed when a giant asteroid crashed on Earth. The oldest material ever found on our planet turns out to be older than our entire solar system. The Murchison meteorite plopped into Australia back in September 1969. But we made this staggering discovery after a newer analysis of its debris was done only in 2020. 
Did you know that there is a coral skyscraper hidden underneath the ocean, and we had no idea? Only in 2020, a team of Australian scientists stumbled upon it when mapping the northern Great Barrier Reef. It's 1,640 feet tall, which, if you think about it, makes it taller than the Empire State Building, and no elevators. Do you know how mountains appeared? We didn't know that until 1966. And that also concerns earthquakes and volcanoes. Just think about it, we sent men into space before we even understood how and why the Earth under our feet started moving now and then. Only in 1966, a scientist named J. Tuzo Wilson published a piece in the journal Nature in which he explained that continents and oceans are constantly moving. He also wrote about tectonic activity, meaning things like earthquakes and how mountains rose from the Earth's surface. Until 2021, we hadn't mapped out a full human genome sequence. The concept of DNA was first presented by a Swiss scientist back in 1869. But specialists remained partially in the dark as to DNA's physical structure until Rosalind Franklin and Raymond Gosling took pictures of it and found it looked like two twisting strands. Ever wonder what the largest living organism in the world was? For a long time, scientists did too, because they only stumbled upon it in 2000. It's a fungus that lives 3 feet underground, but is estimated to spread across 2,200 acres. Located in the Malheur National Forest in the Blue Mountains of eastern Oregon, it's named the honey mushroom. Until 2002, we didn't know what was at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. We knew we were rotating around something. But it took us until the 21st century to figure out it was a supermassive black hole, with a mass 4 million times bigger than our Sun, located in a region of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A star. The discovery took place after we came up with the infrared smoke alarm. I can hardly imagine having to travel long distances without wheeled luggage. But these didn't pop up until 1970. If you think about it, the astronauts who went to the moon actually had to carry their baggage in the spaceship physically. The application for the U.S. patent for the wheeled luggage was granted back in 1972. But to be fair, those first ones weren't exceptionally reliable. They had problems like wobbling and tipping because the large suitcases were mounted on narrow wheeled bottoms. If you look at pictures of 1940s film stars, you'll see that their hair was nice and slicked back. Did you know that based on recent discoveries, even ancient Egyptians used some hair-molding substance? What they used, though, wasn't hair gel, if that's what you're thinking, because we only came up with this invention in the 1960s. What people used for hairstyling back then in the 1940s was called Brill Cream, which had more of a waxy consistency and was invented in 1929. Hair gel, as we know it today, came a bit later and was invented by a man named Louis Montoya. It soon became trendy because it wasn't as greasy as previous products. Speaking of bathrooms, and I am about to, back in ancient Roman times, they used some sort of, uh, well, wiping devices. But they were sticks with a sponge on top. Individually perfumed sheets of paper that had the same purpose appeared to have been documented in China back in 589 CE. However, in the US, medicated paper for the water closet was marketed in the late 1850s. But the soft and comfortable variant of toilet paper was commercialized only in the 1930s, with the added bonus of being completely splinter-free. And I think we can all appreciate that. This one may not seem so recent, but hear me out. Modern research revealed that Saturn's rings are less than 100 million years old or so. That may seem like a lot, but if you think that the solar system formed about 4.5 billion years ago, it does shift your perception a bit, right? There are species of sharks on Earth that have been around in our waters four times longer than Saturn's rings. We figured this out using recent data regarding the mass of Saturn's rings and their ratio of dust and ice. With many of us resorting to e-commerce more and more these days, it's challenging to look at the traditional supermarket as some revolutionary invention. But we didn't have these for as long as you'd think, either. Do you know how the first supermarket appeared? Well, back in 1916, 
a shop owner named Clarence Saunders needed a solution to make his job less labor-intensive, since shopping around then meant he had to pick out all the products from the aisles and even deliver them to customers. So he thought about a new shop layout with a turnstile entry. People had to browse the shop in a single direction. He also made sure they were passing by all the available products. Customers could pick their items themselves and had to take their produce home. The shop owner could lower his prices with added efficiency, since he needed fewer people to run the business. Did you know there's still a state in the US where wearing a seatbelt isn't mandatory? Historically, using a seatbelt was voluntary. But people being the way they were, safety needed some enforcement. The state of New York was the first one to pass a law that enforced seatbelt wearing while driving, but only on December 1, 1984. Still, to this day in New Hampshire, there are no laws on the matter. The modern can opener, the one with the spinning wheel, was first introduced to the market in 1870. Now, that may not be remarkable, but it seems odd when you think canned foods were already available for some decades. Before this invention, we were told to literally cut around the top of the can near the outer edge with a chisel and hammer. You got a meal and an excellent workout all in one. Did you know that standardized time became enforceable by law only in 1880? The current system that we use now, GMT, for Greenwich Mean Time, became a common practice in most countries even later, somewhere by the end of the 1920s. Now, we used to estimate what time it was by looking at the sun's position in the sky. We then evolved to using clocks, but they were still dependent on the sun's position in a particular town or village. That meant time could differ slightly between two neighboring communities. And it wasn't that big of a deal for us until the invention of trains. As we started to travel faster and on longer distances, we needed to figure out a way to know when a train would leave and reach a certain destination, which could be helpful for all travelers in various locations. And frankly, it was about time.